Okay, so that covers a lot of what we're going to do with files. We're going to look at a few other things and then maybe we'll get into some other stuff. So we've looked at the ls command once before. When you run ls like this, you're just going to print out of your files. Often you want to know more about what's actually going on here. Uh, you want to know how big the file is. You want to know when it was last modified. You kind of want to know all these details about the file. So if you do ls-l, l being for long, this gives you the full printout. I'm going to make my screen a little bit smaller so it prints in a more legible manner. So if you do ls-l, you're now getting a bunch of extra information on the file. What we were looking at before, the file name is all the way over here on the right. We also have the date that the file was created, I'm pretty sure. Uh, you could run the man if you want to read the details. This is creation date, that's why they're the same. Um, you can also get, this is the size of the file in bytes. So my file 2 is empty, it's 0 bytes big. This one's 93 bytes big, it's just a text file. It essentially has 93 characters in it, is what that corresponds to. Um, you'll see two things here. Every file has an owner. That's this first item here. This is the name of the user that owns the file. On the VM and right here, the user is called user, so it says user here. If my username was Andy, it would say Andy here, right? If your username was John, if you log into the C-Cell machine, your username is your UTLN, so it would be a UTLN here. Um, you also then have the group. There's a group that also is associated with the ownership of the file. By default, your group name is the same as your username. Uh, we won't get a whole lot into groups, but there are situations where like, if you're working with a big team, your group would be like your team name or something. And what that basically does is it gives your teammates some rights to manipulate that file as well. Over here on the far left, you're going to see this series of characters. These tell us about what the file is. Um, and what we can do with it. The RWs, R is for read, W is for write. There's actually three sets of that repeated here. Uh, this last one that's a dash right here would be for execute. None of these files are executable, so that's why it's a dash. I'll make an example that's not a dash. But what this basically means, the reason it's repeated three times is these are the file permissions for the owner of the file, for the group that owns the file, and then for everyone else. So what this is saying is user can read and write the file, anyone in the user group can read and write the file, and anyone who's not the user and isn't in the user group can only read the file, so they can't write it. Does that kind of make sense? Does it actually make sense? Okay. Um, permissions can get complicated, we won't dive all the way into it, but this can sometimes be a sticking point. If you have a file that you're trying to edit and it's saying cannot edit file, permissions issue, or something like that, do an ls-l. If you don't have this w permission, it means you can't write the file. Um, there are ways to change that. We'll look at that here in a sec. But uh, these will always tell you what the permissions are. Uh, so we have uh, three groups of rwx. Uh, what yes. is the first position? What does that mean? So it's, so it's rwx, rwx, rwx repeated three times. Um, the R is for read, the W is for write. That the position e before that first time. Oh, right here? Yeah. We'll get to that. This tells us whether it's a file or directory. Um, so the dash here, we're looking at two files. I'll show you a directory example in like 30 seconds. Any other questions? So by default, Linux, uh, Windows and OS X both have this too. They have a concept of hidden files files that don't show up normally because they're like used by the operating system or you don't normally want to deal with them. By default in Linux, again, there's nothing special about a hidden file, but by default the ls command doesn't display any file that starts with a dot. So if we had a file called dot text, it wouldn't be displayed right there. Matter of fact, we can make that. So if I do touch and I'm going to do dot hidden file or whatever you want to call it. So if I do ls-l, or if I just do ls, it's not showing me that file I just created. So if we want to see the hidden files, you need to do ls-a, a being for all. And when we do the dash a, we'll see now we have this hidden file here as well. Again, there's nothing special. It's really as simple as the ls command is just programmed to ignore the dot. That's as special as it gets. There's no, this file is no different from these files. 
except for the fact that I started with a dot and the OS command by convention doesn't display that unless you give it the dash. You'll also see, now we'll see, the two directories, the dot directory referring to ourself and the dot dot directory referring up a level. So you'll see these aren't just things we can type after a command, these are actual parts of the file system. Inside every directory is a dot that refers to itself and a dot dot that refers to its parents. We can combine these two options we just looked at by doing ls-al. Uh, this is pretty standard. You can almost always just start concatenating these one letter. Uh, anytime you have one letter options, you can pretty much concatenate them together. This is actually the same as doing ls-a-l. These will both do the exact same thing. But if you want to save your, everyone always just types them together because why type an extra space in dash? So if we do ls-al, now we're looking at everything. So we're seeing all three of my files and my two directories. And getting back to your point, You'll notice that the two directories, the dot and the dot dot, in this case, I mean, they're special directories, but they're still directories, start with a D, whereas all of the other files start with just, uh, start with just a dash. So these are regular files, these are directories, you can tell by whether or not it starts with a D. I could also just make a regular directory and do that same command again, and you'll see, so my directory again just starts with a D. There's nothing special about it. It is it's displayed just like dot, dot, dot. You will also notice that the directories, by default, have the execute permission. Uh, this execute permission can mean a couple of different things. When you have it with a file, it generally means that file represents a program. And the execute then means that you're giving the operating system the right to load that file like a program and run it. Um, with a directory, the execute permission just means you have the right to go into that directory. So in this case, we have the execute permission. That means that we can do cd into my directory. If we didn't have this x here and I tried to cd into my directory, it would give me an error. OK? Don't get too hung up on this permissioning stuff. It's one of those things that you pick up the more you use this kind of things. I'm mainly showing it to you because there are a set of issues it can sometimes cause. And if someone tells you to check the permissions, they want you to run this command and tell them what this group of letters over here essentially is. Right? Um, you can also Google Unix permissions and read about this kind of stuff all day. Um, but this is kind of the bare bones of what you might need to know to get through the classes you're currently in. 